says, Yeh mujhe pata hai, I know this, and that's saying that you can accept a credit card or, or cash. And uh, also, we support, uh, you know, just regular keyword based uh, question answering as well. And, you know, these, this audience doesn't typically form proper English sentences or proper English sentences. So we have to support uh, a Q&A for, uh, you know, keywords or, or broken phrases. Tells him he's uh, scheduled for the day. Uh, and then lastly, he asks how he can get a promotion because everybody wants to grow in their careers, right? <laughs> so it actually crowdsources this answer. So it goes to the community of delivery words, and uh, we're trying to create a stack over prototype dynamic within uh, this community so that you know, we can crowdsource. So it 
queries, but uh, in some cases we've seen up to 5% reduction in some locations. What does the location mean by the Yeah, so essentially the, the skills gap problem, right? But even within that, uh, that is really the largest segment, or I should say the segment that has the largest growth in India. So uh, we look at India in, in sort of three tiers. There's India 1, which is people like us, mostly middle class. Uh, and today, I think there are 40, 50 million people uh, around. And uh, in a few years, in five years' time, there'll be about 100 million people, right? And there's India 2, which is the blue collar segment. And that segment is uh, close to about 50 million people today. But in another five years, that will be the largest, about 600 million people. And then the third pillar is your local audience, right? But those guys are very far from getting access to this tech. So we're really looking at the uh, higher volume. So to move on, so one of the core uh, problems that we're trying to solve here is building NLP for informal languages, right? So on, on messaging, on chat, uh, like WhatsApp, people don't really use a formal language, right? Uh, especially in this segment, they're not using English, they're not using Hindi, they're not using Kannada, they're not using any of these, it's usually a mix. Uh, and so if I'm a native Hindi speaker, I'll probably use English, so of Hindi and English, right? Um, and this is a relatively new phenomenon, right? Uh, millions of people have come online for the first time in India in the last few years, and uh, really WhatsApp or messaging is really their gateway to the internet. Um, so there is a very poor data availability for these languages. There isn't really, because it's a new phenomenon and it's fairly dynamic, like this language is sort of being created as we speak, uh, there also hasn't been a lot of research on these informal languages. Uh, people have done research uh, in other markets, so like in the US, uh, people have done research on uh, informal languages or social media languages on Twitter, etc. Right? But Twitter isn't something that's heavily used in India, especially by this audience. So it's not something that we can use to tap uh, for data. Right? So it's a very new problem um, with very poor data availability. So you know, to build good models, you need to have more data. So that's one big challenge. The other challenge is who kind of are interrelated, there's very high variability in this kind of an informal language. Uh, one, because there's no standardization, right? It's an informal language by definition. So um, my English would be different from your English, would be different from your English. Uh, there's just no standardization in terms of syntax uh, or sort of word representation, right, on the word form level. Uh, so that makes it even more important to get more data, right, because there's so much variation. And then I kind of mentioned this earlier, cultural influences also change the way uh, people uh, utter this language. So somebody who's from the West will have a very different English than somebody who's from the East, you know, than the North of India. So, <coughs> so Andrew Ng uh, is one of the world's uh, leading uh, AI and machine learning researchers. Um, and so he has this quote, and he says that uh, uh, it's not who has the best algorithm that wins, it's really who has the most data. Right, so data today is uh, really like money. Uh, if you have uh, a very big, valuable uh, store of data, uh, you can do a lot with that. Right, so algorithms can take you to a certain degree, but uh, really for um, you know reaching sort of the last mile. Getting more data uh, to be very important. Obviously, this it doesn't apply to all problems, but to most, for most problems, this is true. Right? So we have actually tried a lot of different things to collect uh, data for uh, the common language. Um, I'll mention a few of those. So uh, we had uh, built a virtual English teacher on WhatsApp, and we uh, found that uh, people were adding that virtual English teacher to their uh, groups, to their WhatsApp groups. And when the bot is in the WhatsApp group, it can actually get all the messages from that group. Right? And this happened, started happening completely organically. Right? Actually, telling people to add the bot to groups. In fact, it doesn't even work in groups. It's a one-to-one -one bot. So then we started building other uh, group bots. So we built a bot that sends a joke every day. We built a bot that sends a good morning message every day. That's the most popular thing. WhatsApp. We send we built a bot uh, that sends inspirational quotes as well every day, right? And we got people to add those 
like rules. Um, we even added these bots to public rules. So there are thousands and thousands of WhatsApp public rules uh, out there that you can find on various websites and Facebook and stuff. So we added our bot to a bunch of those uh, as well. But we found that the spam rate was very, very high. I think about 60, 70 percent of bot messages were just junk uh, videos, you know, crap. Stuff that was not useful for us at all. And it was also a very untargeted way of gathering data. We didn't really know what we were going to get. Um, so that didn't really work out. Uh, we tried a few different bots. We tried an English translator. So the hope was uh, that people would use it to, uh, on WhatsApp to uh, translate what they were going to say to their friends. You know, so if I'm uh, trying to impress somebody and uh, I need to translate, then I would say in English, I would use this bot, and then we would capture their uh, utterance, right? And then we'd be able to use that. But uh, something like a translator is not used very often, so we uh, could use it maybe twice a week or twice a week at the most. So uh, the rate at which we were capturing data was very slow. So then we also built uh, something called Friend Finder, which actually worked. Um, so have you heard of a, a product called Chat Roulette? came out maybe 10 years ago, some uh, Russian teenager had built this. Uh, it went absolutely viral, so it was a web uh, application that would connect you with a random stranger uh, to do video chat. Okay. So it, it, this thing had exploded back in the day, I, I don't know what they're doing now, but we were inspired by that and we built that for SG on Facebook Messenger. So we connect random strangers and they chat with each other. And this has worked surprisingly well. Uh, we are now collecting close to 2 million messages a month through this and ramping up very, very fast. Uh, people produce approximately, uh, on average now, about 150 messages a day per user. So it's it's a very, very engaging part. And as you can see, I don't know if you can see the, the script here, but this is all English data. Right? This is all uh, Hindi, but type using the English keyboard essentially, right? So this is the data that we need essentially to train our models. Right, so we now work with a small uh, shop in Punta, uh, I think it's close to Gokarna. Uh, and they do all our data animation uh, and then we use uh, the animated data to train our models. So, there are many ways to solve this problem. Um, the ultimate goal really is to, when somebody types something in English, in English, is to come up with a structured representation of that. So basically, um, from going from five words, it should go to say a JSON representation, a structured representation that your bot can make sense of and then perform the most relevant action. Right. So we built this stack initially, uh, kind of test out. Uh, so we can dirty stack we try. Um, so it starts with somebody saying log out as a kare, just an example. And kare here is, is spelled uh, in a non-standard format, perhaps a non-canonical format. So the first step here is to normalize it or to canonicalize the utterance. Uh, and we build a statistical machine translation model there, SMP model. Um, I think it's a word-based model. Uh, and we've achieved close to 15% reduction in word error rate. So what that means is, if you take the uh, vocabulary or the dictionary of uh, English and you compare it with, say, canonical English, uh, about 46% of the words are out of that vocabulary. Uh, but we reduce that by 15% throughout that model. Okay. So it converts that log of Kesekari into a standard form. Uh, then we use Google Translate to translate that to English. Uh, and then we built an intent classification model to actually convert the English uh, sentence or question in this case to a structured representation. So it classifies the intent of the articles as a question. Uh, and it tells you that it's a question about logging out of the app. Uh, and then we look up our index of uh, content essentially to serve out the answer. Right. So all of these uh, different components in this stack uh, do pretty well, 
except maybe the SMP model, which we're kind of working on. But everything here has pretty good uh, performance, right? Uh, however, when you build a stack like this, um, you end up with uh, propagation of errors. So the net error of the entire system will be a product of all the uh, individual errors of the components, right? So if you calculate it, it comes out to be about 50%, which is not horrible. You shouldn't have a production level system that is getting 50 percent accuracy, unless you have ones in the background. Um, so we're rethinking this, and we're doing a lot of different experiments. Um, and here are a couple of the experiments that we're currently working on. Uh, and these are also focused on um, you know, solving this problem given the fact that we are uh, poor on data. Right? It's, a, it's a resource poor language for which we're trying to solve this problem. So on one hand, we are trying to gather more and more data to our uh, end point of uh, application. And on the other hand, we are trying to find uh, our algorithms or use better algorithms to manage this problem. Um, so for the NLU part, which is essentially converting and afterwards into the structured format to classify the intent of the user. Uh, we're experimenting with uh, learning word embeddings um, from other languages. Right? So can we do word embeddings from English or from Hindi to learn word embeddings for English? Uh, because those word embeddings are a very key component of uh, these energy models. Um, right, so we don't have enough data on English today, so we can't uh, create more on our own embeddings and we're trying to infer them from all that. So there's a really good paper by Sebastian Luther. Uh, it's a survey paper and he goes over all the different approaches um, that people have used uh, to learn embeddings for that for a particular language from another language. So we should uh, maybe take a look at that if you're interested. And then the second problem here that is still relevant is normalization, which is uh, converting a, a non-standard utterance in English to a uh, canonical form, right? Um, and today we're using word-based uh, SMP, so it's machine translation, and we're uh, trying to use more character-level features, character-based uh, language translation, and that also helps a lot uh, in the case where you are uh, data constrained, right? When you don't have a, a large vocabulary. Uh, this is something that works pretty well as a screen show of research. So there's a paper by Ryan in there that uh, we're we'll have to link to. Uh, and that's uh, what we're implementing. Uh, this is the founding team, uh, Balan. So uh, me and I have a master's in computer science uh, from Columbia. I specialized in uh, machine learning. In fact, uh, spent about uh, 10 years in the startup space in the US uh, and moved to India to years ago to start Balan. And then uh, my co-founder, uh, Omar, or Mo for short, he's a head of product. Uh, Mo is an engineer from Stanford, and then uh, he was a product leader on Siri. Uh, he joined Siri when they were a startup, in fact, and then Apple acquired them. So he worked at Apple, and he launched uh, Siri as part of iPhone. Yes. And that's it. So uh, we're uh, always hiring. People and we're looking for uh, data scientists or budding data scientists, especially people who are passionate about the problem that we're solving, not just the technical problem, but also the problem of uh, maybe getting these new problem workers to uh, perform at their potential. Um, we're also hiring full stack engineers, we're also hiring sales people. So, in case you're interested, feel free to email me and we can take a conversation there. That's it.